Welcome to Off the Press, the program where we take a look at the national dailies and make sense of it. For today's program, I will be joined by Plus TV senior producer Ekene Ezeji. Welcome to the program. It's a pleasure. So today, let's begin with Nigeria Tribune. The big story here is FG spends 1.57 trillion naira on debt servicing, 1.61 trillion naira on personnel and pension. We also see details of that here on page six, saying FG also releases uh, one trillion naira for capital projects, proposes $40 oil benchmark for 2021 physical year, and uh, this comes as finance minister warns of possible recession. The Nigerian Tribune also says hoodlums attack Obasaki's campaign team. 818 million children worldwide risk contracting COVID-19, and that's according to the UNICEF. Uh, NBC's hate speech prohibition code offensive to free speech, and that's by Atiku. We also see here on, uh, on page uh, five, Nigerian Tribune having this story saying Nigeria moves to end U.S. visa restrictions. Also, two feared dead as customs officers, Saki residents clash. Also, family holds private burial for Akinjide. Thanks uh, again for joining us, uh, Ezeji. Let's uh, now talk about the Nigerian Tribune. Which of the stories would you like to shine a light on this morning? Actually, several of them. Um, maybe we should just start with the 8.18 million. Okay, no, actually, let's before that, that the federal government is about to spend 1.57 trillion on debt servicing. We heard Atiku cry. He seems to be you know, kicking in as the opposition uh, party now and really you know, making noise about things that really we ought to be hearing coming from the polity. And he's saying that the federal government spending 1.57 trillion on debt servicing. And I think to his own account, not some months earlier, he had sort of said that we're spending almost 100% of our loans on debt servicing. It doesn't make sense really for those of us who are not even economically inclined, but it just seems like there's something seriously amiss. Um, but what we need to draw attention to is the fact that economists have often said that there's more to this than meets the eye, that it's not so much even that we're taking loans, it's the fact that there's no projection as to how we're going to come out of our debts. So you're borrowing, but they don't, there's no viable option on the table that says this is how you're going to climb out of, of your debts. And yet, it's not that there aren't options available. It just seems that somehow we seem to be in a state of stasis, or I don't know if we're overwhelmed, or you know, because there's so many factors we don't know. Why is it that with people like Osibajo at the helm of affairs, you know, brains like that, handling uh, matters of the state, that we don't get clear direction as to the way forward? And now, even if we hadn't had COVID-19, we're in that position where we were not clear as to our way forward. Now we have COVID-19, and they say there's a possible looming recession. Most people will say it's imminent. It's mm -hmm. not just possible. Um, but that's not still the problem. What is the, the roadmap out of this situation, which the whole world is facing, not just Nigeria. You know, if you touch on countries like South Africa, they are on their knees as well. You touch on the recent um, issue in Beirut. P people are really in a state of um, desperation when it comes to economic matters now, especially at this time. So we need to think fast and we need to tap into the brains that we have because we do have those brains. We do have the human capital. We do have the raw materials. What are we doing to, and not just by taxes, because I see that's the knee-jerk reaction. What more are we doing to stir up, stimulate the economy at this time. And not uh, incur debts to pay off debts. It doesn't make sense, really. All right, so how about this attack on uh, Obasaki's campaign team? I mean, what do you have to say about that? You know, in truth, I would like to overlook that because I just feel that they are distracting us from the main affairs because this is leading up to an election and already we're having, you know, us against them. We're having, you know, leaked information of people outrightly coming and doing uh, press statements or national addresses to say this is happening to us. It's a distraction, really, because what it does is that whenever you do have the elections, there will be a basis for saying it wasn't transparent and fair. So we're not comfortable with this kind of player. We would love to see someone like INEC or some authority, even the president, step in and put an end to all these, um, do you say, rumors um, that are flying around. Mm -hmm. Let's stop making it another drama in a series of dramas. Let's get down to brass tax. Let's say, what is it that's really the procedure for running an election and make sure people obey that and, if, and find a way of penalizing them instantly. So anybody who is stepping out of line, you, they, you know, if it means that they're disqualified, they're disqualified. Let's stop acting like we're children in the playground. We're adults and we're dealing with national matters here. So let's, let's address them. Hmm. Interesting there. Let's uh, still look at Nigerian Tribune just below. Uh, the stories, top stories we had on The Breakfast earlier uh, on page five of the Nigerian Tribune. The story here says, 
Unilag crisis worsens. Sacked VC goes to court. I remember asking our guest just uh, if this crisis would be resolved internally or would we see a recourse uh, to, to, to the court. And here we see here that uh, the sacked VC has approached the court for justice. Also, Boko Haram terrorist now recruiting child soldiers. Yes. Wow. Yeah, those two stories are quite striking. I mean, the Unilag one, you, we've heard from several angles and it would seem that procedurally there's a problem. It would seem that the sacking of the VC has somehow flouted the procedural rules. Um, again, we will be paying, paying close attention to this because in recent times we've seen issues of whether elections in the um, NBA or even the, um, the NMA, the, the national... Um, the body that deals with the, the doctors in Enugu, we've seen the electoral processes seem to be somewhat lacking and, and actually a letdown when it comes to the fact that they're still hiring hoodlums, it would seem, even though they claim they haven't done that. So now we're looking again at a situation that the whole of us, our attention is on them. What exactly is going on here? Um, someone said to me, someone who is closely related to the ASU um, incident said, look, this is a case of strong institutions being trying, someone, a strong man is trying to hold down a strong institution and essentially it won't be allowed to, 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 to bear out. Um, we'd like to see what the courts do and if indeed when they do make their ruling it will be obeyed because this whole story of factions, whether one faction coming up against another faction, is not satisfactory in, in our eyes. We need to really pin down that what is at stake here is for the nation to be seen, to be conducting things in a way that is uh, standard across, across board, in a way that um, people will look on from outside and have respect for our institutions. But where you see this kind of thing playing out in the public domain, it actually undermines an institution that should really be the bastion and churning out people who respect the rule of law, who respect procedures, and yet they're the very ones seeming to be playing politics with it. So what hope is there for the common man? I mean, and just see how that is affecting innocent students who, who should be, you know, leaving the school institution to find work, the convocation yeah. having to yes. be stalled. Yes, I heard you raise that with the guest earlier. And, and, you know, even though he says it's not really a case of the students, first things first, you're right. I mean, you know, the common saying, when two elephants fight, the grass suffers. And that's such an irony because, I mean, the reason why a school exists in the first place is for the students. Yes. So anyway, <laughs> yes, it's good of you to say that. Exactly. Moving on now to mm. the Punch newspaper. Uh, we did see earlier on that uh, Melafia uh, actually came out to say uh, at uh, a radio interview saying that uh, he was privy to information that uh, about Boko Haram and who their commander was and their planned attacks for the South South in 2023. Mm. And we're seeing here the front page of the punch, uh, Boko Haram governor is uh, saying, uh, don't sweep Melafia's allegations under the carpet. ACF tells governors, don't sweep Melafia's allegations under the carpet. So we see here also the Middle Belt Youths is uh, praising ex-CBN governor uh, for insisting on allegations. It says, don't make a hero out of Melafia, uh, Dean Bornu, consent elders, advises youth. Uh, we also see here, sacked Unilag VC heads for court, leads workers protest. Wow, that's a, that's a new spin on that one. <laughs> yes, I mean, the Melafia thing, we know it had some controversy relating to uh, a popular uh, radio station. I think he went on there and made that statement and they're suffering for it. Um, and I tend to go with the other people who say these are all distractions in a sense that, you know, you're saying you know somebody who is sponsoring some. Just go through the proper channels and let's see this thing prosecuted and brought to light. Stop coming supposedly to the media, to the public courts, and all you're doing is making people think that there's some sort of shadow playing behind the shadows. We want to, we have, we need clarity more than ever now. We've been on this fight for the longest time. So to bring up something like this in the public domain, I'm not saying that it's not to be addressed, but why bring it to the public? We're not, we're, we're, we're not, we can't do anything we're powerless except to continue to churn out rumors and distract us from we need to hold our government accountable. You know, how, let's deal with facts. How much has been spent? How much progress has been made? Let's chart it. Let's make it transparent. You know, if they're being recruited, where are they being recruited? What are the numbers? These are figures that we tend to get from UNICEF and bodies like that. We're not seeming to be championing the cause of dealing with, with data, which is what we want. More data-driven analysis on the situation on the ground and not, not some of these uh, rumor-mongering. Fantastic. Now let's talk uh, business and the economy. Here on page 17 of The Punch, it says a second recession in four years loom, says FG. Also, we see 648 Nigerian evacuees test positive for COVID-19. $2.2 million collected from Adoki 
to pay bank loan. And that's by an ex-MD. So there's a lot more stories here. We see uh, still about that story that was highlighted on the front page of the Nigerian Tribune. Here on page 13 of the punch saying Edo blames APC thugs for attack on Obaseki's campaign trail. We see here now the back and forth yes. uh, trail of blames here again. Mm -hmm. And uh, all APC aspirants are supporting me, says Akiri Dulu. And lastly here, on, uh, on the punch, housewife falsely accuses Lagos businessman of attempted rape. Wow. Well, Interesting. Yeah, you know, the rape story, are we happy that it's making the headlines? I think we are because we still want that not to be, get, um, to, to be suppressed. You know, the time when we had say no to rape and there was a, an uproar, you know, um, and it seems for now it's gone, it's gone, it's died down a little bit. So with this making the headlines, at least on the punch, um, we're hopeful that we'll continue to still pay attention to that because the problem in, re in previous times was we didn't have enough reporting on rape. So now that we're having more and more reporting on rape, we want to pay attention to it. We want to see how this kind of a report is processed and um, whether she does find some sort of justice as a result of bringing it to light. Let, let's see where that goes. But the challenge here about the story, it's a housewife. And the story here says falsely accuses. So in a situation where you find there's a lot of investigation and they discover that it's a false accusation, how, how does this impact the real victims of rape. Well, I think it's, it's fair because you want to show that both sides are being given an audience. I mean, I think the recent worry with the, the bill that was brought against, the lecturers felt it was against them, was they felt it was, it was tilted against them. It made them look like they were having to defend themselves. They were guilty before they, they were proven innocent. So hopefully now, if this case is heard and it's not, there's no bias, if she falsely accused him, fine. We're not trying to project a false impression that every time you, you cry rape, it's, it's always true. But let's make sure that it's done in a way that doesn't leave anything to question. Um, if it's done like that, then people won't be afraid to come out. Neither will um, people be afraid to be tried because they know that it's, it's, it's an objective court. We mm. hope. That's the best we can hope for, I think. Indeed. Mm. And uh, heading out to the nation newspaper, government uh, says Nigeria economy risk return to recession. Oof, not a lot of uh, great news right there for yeah. the economy. Uh, debt sustainability crisis likely. And uh, uh, this, this other keynote here is saying businesses should key into 2.6 trillion Naira package. And uh, also on the nation, we see the story here. NJC tips four justices for Supreme Court. NJC tips four justices for Supreme Court. We also see here U.S. Uh, visa restriction over soon. U.S. visa restriction over soon. Also, Second Republic Minister Akinjide buried in Ibadan. And NBC slams five million Naira fine on radio station. Do, do you want to talk about this, uh, uh, about the NBC, the new rules they're, they're formulating and uh, the fine on radio stations or, or, or something else? Uh, making yes, the because I here? think that also tallies with the, you know, I think there was a, an initial headline you raised that had to do with people being more concerned about hate speech bill. You know, there seems to be a move towards that. In fact, let's just say that move never went away. And, you know, even with the social media bill and the anti-hate speech bill, People have not been comfortable with the move towards what they see, rightly, I think, as a clamping down on free speech. At a time when people are justifiably frustrated with the way governments are executing their mandate. So I would say it's not a very popular move. Sometimes it even makes the polity question, what, why is the government prioritizing um, hate speech or anti-hate speech? And why are they prioritizing? Not because if things were going well, they don't have a right to trying to maintain a kind of um, sanity in the public space. But when things are not going well <laughs> and you start prioritizing this, it sends out the wrong message. Mm -hmm. So really what we need to see more of is attention given to what we're saying, stimulating the economy, empowering the youth. Because there are several things that have come out that don't seem to be favoring the youth. I, I won't go down that road because hopefully in subsequent bulletins we'll look at them, whether taxes, um, but that's for another discussion. So we need, this is the time to almost jumpstart the youth to, to, to step into that public forum and to make their mark. And it doesn't help that because why I'm making it a youth issue is because most times you would find it's the youth that are playing in that social media space. And so if you stifle them, you stifle their free speech and you don't empower them in any way to, you're basically disenfranchising them. And, mm. and, and most people have argued that that would then lead to a throttling of their rights and they're left with no other option than to go out and protest or revolt. And that's not very healthy. 
Interesting. Still on the, the Nation newspaper, we're seeing updates on the Edo Ondo 2020 elections. And we see here that uh, a monarch donates one million naira to Ize Iyamu. Quite a heavy one there. <laughs> Obasiki will be re-elected because of his performance. Aspirants jostled to become Jekede's running mate. And Mimiko abandoned Ajago's project, says Keridulu. Do you want to stay on the issue of the Edo policy? Maybe, I know you've maybe, talked about maybe, that. Maybe as much as I want to leave it, it, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. And one of the things that this raises in my mind is that we need to find a way of restricting the amount of money spent on election campaigns. Why a monarch sees fit to throw so much money behind a candidate suggests that it's an investment, you know. I'm, I'm not, I don't know the monarch, I'm not, so I have nothing against this particular monarch. But I'm saying, if you don't, this is why other countries are very particular about how much money is spent on election campaigns. They actually make it a very transparent process because it leads to godfatherism, it leads to puppeteering, it means that the person can actually go there and execute the people's mandate. They've been bought in advance. We don't want to have that continue because it already happens, continue in our politics. And then amidst all these things, Obaseki, Ezeyamu, we're not hearing of any other party. And these two dominant parties, most people would admit, have been recycling the same, they're pretty much two sides of the same coin. So why are we still preoccupied with them? I'm, I'm really crying. It's almost like the voice crying in the wilderness because it's not, nothing new is likely to happen at this stage. It's just to, for those who are paying attention to sort of recognize that this is not really where we should be. I mean, as much as it's being forced upon us as headlines, it's really not making, it's not news in anybody's book. We want to see uh, issues of the state being discussed. What is your mandate? What are you offering to do? We would find it a breath of fresh air if a new candidate just stepped in and offered something. Especially what are youth, you doing for the younger. people? Yeah, yeah. Who okay. has the interests of, of the, the youth at hand. Yeah, I'm sure those people the are there, but hand. at the moment, these elephants are dumbing down mm. the discussion. Thank you so much uh, for being a part of, of the press today. And uh, it's a wrap. This is where we uh, draw the curtain and our lineup today on The Breakfast. You can look forward to more of the same right here on Plus TV Africa. The news continues with news on the hour after the break.